Hello everybody! Today I'm going to wrap up the seven books I read for the 2020 reading rush. I did do a TBR to start out with and I read almost everything on that TBR, but I made two last minute substitutions that worked out quite well. I really enjoyed pretty much everything that I read, uh, so it was very successful in that regard. I did read seven books, which is what I aim for every year with this readathon, and I completed the seven reading challenges. So let's get into it! First up for the challenge of read a book from a genre that you want to read more of, um, I have Mexican Gothic by Silvia Moreno Garcia. Specifically I chose this because it is really gothic fiction and horror. And I really enjoyed this. It was one of my favorite reads of the entire readathon. And I buddy read it with Rachel from The Shades of Orange. It was really great to talk to somebody about this. We were both quite pleased with it, I think, and it was nice to read it with somebody who's more familiar with the genre conventions, I guess. Um, it was very quickly consumed, very much enjoyed, and I will have a separate review of this out soon where I can go into way more depth about what I noticed in the book and what I thought about it overall. For people who are curious about this in terms of it being horror, I didn't actually find the book to be that scary. The horror element of it to me was more like body horror, and I don't think that body horror is scary, I just think it's gross. But your mileage will vary on that one. The next book I have to talk about is The Doll Maker by Nina Allen. This was one of my last minute substitutions because I wanted to read it for a book chat and had to read it in like three days for that to be possible. Um, I actually read the entire book in two days. Um, it's not short either. Um, so I read this for the challenges of read a book that begins with the as well as read a book that takes place on a continent other than where you live. And this takes place in England. So this is a bit of a peculiar story. I would call it an experience, a kind of haunting experience. Um, after talking about it with friends who'd also read it, I think we all kind of agree that it was very atmospheric. We'll remember it because um, of the way it made us feel while we were reading it, but it's a bit harder to capture the concrete things that happened and remember the plot. Um, Despite that, I actually think this is the most memorable of all the books I've read by Nina Allen. It is quite complex and very almost dreamlike in the way that it weaves together this connection between reality and stories that are eerily similar to the reality and is there a reason for that or is it just coincidence? Um, so the story mainly follows a man named Andrew who is a doll maker and it's his, his story about how he came to be fascinated by dolls, how he became a doll maker himself, and the relationship, the, like, the pen pal relationship he has with a woman that he met through the, the doll community. So um, you don't see his letters to his friend, but you see her letters, her name is Bramber, um, her letters to him telling her own story um, are in this narrative as well. And then interspersed with all of that, there are these fictional stories written by um, another doll maker, Eva Chaplin, um, who is very famous um, in this fictional world, of course. Um, she was a Polish refugee who ended up in England um, during World War II and her dolls are collector's items, but also she's a fascinating, mysterious person, and she had some stories published after her death. And those stories mirror a lot of what is happening to the, the real characters in, in the real world. Um, there's a lot about dolls and dolls that resemble people, and I personally think that the relationship between the the stories within the story and the relationship between the dolls and the people they resemble is kind of the same relationship that we see between images of people like dolls and humans. I don't know how to express that very well. I'm trying not to say like voodoo dolls, that sort of thing, but um, it is eerie. Dolls can be both beautiful and creepy as heck. And making a doll, making a visual representation of somebody else has power. Sometimes it is just coincidence, but sometimes it is intended. And I think that that relationship we see between dolls and people is part of what the structure of the story is based on. And it also ha it has these repeated motifs and themes of dwarfism, 
um, disability, especially injuries or deformities of hands, um, and some other things as well. I'm a little bit uncomfortable with those elements of the book, mainly because I wasn't sure if they were handled sensitively. I did feel like a lot of the use of those things, the characters with dwarfism, um, the characters that had, you know, injuries to their hands and things, sometimes it was done in a very realistic way, but also sometimes I felt like it could reinforce some negative stereotypes of the way that disabled people are represented in media. I don't, I don't have very clear ideas on this. I would love to see a review of this book from somebody who can speak to those elements, you know, like sort of an own voices review of it. All of it was frankly fascinating and I couldn't stop reading the book. I thought that I had picked the wrong length of book for a readathon and then I just couldn't stop reading it and I only wanted to read this for the two days until I had it done. So quite an experience, quite complicated. I would mostly categorize this as historical or contemporary fiction. I don't understand the spec fic label that gets put on this. I don't think there's actually any speculative element to it at all, unless you wanted to interpret some of the eerie similarities as being supernatural, perhaps? I don't know. I simply didn't read it that way. Um, so yeah, a pretty unusual novel. Um, I would recommend this. It's probably my second favorite of Nina Allen's books. I really enjoyed The Rift and I particularly enjoyed the SFF elements of that, which is why it kind of ranks a bit higher. But I think that The Dollmaker is perhaps a better technical achievement in storytelling. I'll go, I'll go with that. <laughs> For the challenge of read a book with the color of your birthstone on the cover, I read A Wizard's Guide to Defensive Baking by T. Kingfisher because it has a very purple cover and my birthstone is amethyst. Um, this is the newest book out from Ursula Vernon under her T. Kingfisher pen name and I loved it. It was my one five-star read, like just outright five-star read of the readathon. Um, not necessarily because it's the best, but because it really really elicited a lot of emotions from me. Um, but it is another of her middle grade novels with um, younger protagonists with a minor magical ability that just couldn't get picked up by a traditional publisher. And I don't understand why. I think that this book in particular would make a great middle grade novel. Just, I don't understand people's objections to it for the audience. It's great. Um, there's nothing in it particularly too dark about it, I think, for, for a younger audience. I've certainly read more harrowing books aimed at younger readers, let, let's say that. Um, but it is about a 14-year-old girl named Mona. She is a baker, and her magical ability is just that she can do things with dough. So she can convince dough to, to do the right thing, to bake up the right way. She can animate gingerbread men, one of the most fun things about this for me is that she kind of accidentally creates a gingerbread man familiar who rides around on her shoulder and stuff. Um, there are like eight foot tall gingerbread men golems that are used in the war in the story. Um, so essentially it begins when she comes into the bakery one morning and uh, stumbles across a dead body and there is a serial killer in the city who is targeting wizards and a powerful figure in the city's government is also targeting wizards. Um, she ends up being the only mage left in the city when it is attacked and she has to help defend it. There's a lot more to it than that but I enjoyed it. It made me laugh and then it made me cry. Like ugly cry at the end. Maybe I was feeling particularly emotional at that time, but it was just, it played on my heartstrings, guys. So yeah, I love this book very much. I would highly recommend it if you are looking for a T. Kingfisher story to begin with. This is a good one. To read a book entirely outside of my house, I read Picnic on Paradise by Joanna Russ. I um, actually read this one outside, sitting outside in the heat, being eaten by mosquitoes, uh, mostly as a last ditch attempt to finish something in the allotted time period for the readathon. It is the shortest thing I read. It's about 150 pages long, so roughly a novella. This was published in 1968, I believe. Um, somewhere in here it says, 
1968, and it is about a time travel agent from ancient Greece named Alex who is brought forward in time in order to lead a group of tourists across a planet called Paradise where a war has broken out. I did not completely understand the point of why they had to take this journey. I think I missed it. Um, either through inattention or lack of explanation, but it's a scenario to have a group of very mismatched people who have no experience in mountain climbing, for example, being led by a grizzled woman who just is like, these babies, these babies, they're all gonna die. Um, and they do. I mean, it's just a, a harrowing journey across the surface of a planet where they, they cannot be noticed by the people doing the warfare because then they'll die, but also they might die because of the inclement weather, etc. And stuff happens. I actually thought it was a pretty entertaining story. I got into it but I have quibbles with it, like the premise, what the heck is going on here? Um, but the one thing, I finished reading it and was like, why do you gotta do that, Russ? Was that Alex is a very strong, independent woman, like she's just out there, you know? And she is shoved into a pseudo-romantic sexual relationship with one of the guys in the group. It's like, why? Why? There's absolutely no reason to do that, especially because I felt it was kind of at odds with what Russ actually wanted to do with portraying women. It's just, I don't understand it. Um, I don't know. <laughs> As a standalone story about a time travel agent, a very unusual one, and I don't know, kind of subverting the system and also people dying and on an adventure, eh, it's good entertainment. I'm not sure I would highly recommend it though. Um, but all that being said, I'm really enjoying actually reading Russ's work rather than just reading about her and her role in basically feminism and science fiction in like the 70s and 80s and stuff. It's good to actually read what she herself wrote and was known for at the time. Um, the last book that I read for a challenge in the readathon is Howl's Moving Castle by Diana Wynne Jones. This was for the challenge of read a book where you've already seen the movie adaptation of it. Um, I have seen the um, Hayao Miyazaki a Studio Ghibli version of Howl's Moving Castle three or four times at this point. Um, it was a reread for me, actually. I read this book about 17 years ago when I was about 13 years old. I'm a big Diana Wynne Jones fan for anybody who's new here and doesn't know that. I've read all of her books and I love them. Um, but I was curious about how much I actually remembered about the book versus how much the movie version has uh, kind of erased my original experiences of, you know, the book itself. Um, and interestingly, a lot of the elements are the same, but it's more complex. There are more people and more subplots in the book, and I actually think that the movie version was really smart to cut out a lot of that and to combine a bunch of the characters to make it simpler. I think that actually works a bit better. Uh, but it has a very a very DWJ plot where everything is just kind of crazy and up in the air and then it just starts to fall into place at the end, which is one of those things I've always loved about her books. Um, and I also think that Howell comes across as worse in the book. In the movie, he is a bit of a romantic figure. I think he comes across as more sympathetic. You, you get to see his own adventures and what he's up to. Um, and some of it, you know, is good stuff. Whereas in the book, a lot of that is completely hidden from you. And I didn't really buy it at the end that he was more sympathetic. Like, I just didn't didn't get it. Like, he, he comes across as way more vain and self-interested and using other people and not very sympathetic to what they're going through. And it felt like a bit of hand waving at the end to say, oh no, he really had good intentions the whole way through and now he's gonna be like the best love interest or whatever. No one would actually want to live with a person like him. <laughs> 
but it was such good fun. I loved it. This is another five star read though, a reread. Um, and I really need to go on and reread the two other books in this series right away because I don't know how many people actually know this, but uh, this is part of a series. It's like a trilogy. There are two other books and I have no memory of them whatsoever. And I read them all at very different time periods when I didn't realize they connected at all. So it'll be interesting to read all three books close together and see how much of a series they are. Like, is it a chronological sequence of events or more thematically linked, perhaps? I don't know. I will find out. I also read two other books for the readathon in order to reach seven books. I listened to the audiobook version of Rise of the Jumbies by Tracy Bautiste. This is the second in the Jumbies series. It is Caribbean fantasy middle grade, and I really enjoyed it. Um, I haven't talked about the first book yet. That will be in a separate wrap up because I read it, I think, at the end of June and still haven't talked about it. Um, but it is about a young girl named Corinne and her friends who go on adventures. They live on a Caribbean island, which I assume to be Trinidad and Tobago because that's where Batiste is from, but it's, I don't think it's actually stated what island it is. Um, but yeah, they have adventures um, involving jumbies, which are like the shapeshifters, kind of fae folk, perhaps. I think this is something actually from Caribbean folklore or something, which is something I still need to research. Anyway, it was good. I didn't love it as much as the first book, but it was a very different type of story. Um, I'm, I really love the narration of the stories in the audiobook versions. Robin Miles does a fantastic job, and I also really enjoy the secondary characters. Corinne, the protagonist, is, is fine, but I, I enjoy her friend a little bit more than her. So yeah, I'll probably talk more about the series when I get around to actually talking about the first book. And I also listened to an audiobook um, dramatization of Cymbeline by William Shakespeare. I was a bit nervous about trying to listen to a Shakespeare play without having read the play in print first because uh, I thought it would be very confusing. It was good that the version I listened to, it, it it sounded like the recording of a movie version. It had sound effects and multiple actors and everything and music. It was really good. And I really enjoyed it. Like perhaps the experience of, of hearing it performed and actually spoken aloud that really influenced how I, I perceived it and I, how much I enjoyed it. Um, I don't know how to summarize the plot of this other than I've seen it described as like the king's daughter marries a man that nobody likes and then all hell breaks loose, kind of like that. Um, there's cross-dressing, you know, you've got typical woman pretending to be a man, stolen children and all of that. Um, it was good, I liked it. The only difficulty I had is that a lot of the male actors sounded the same to me and there were instances where I wasn't sure who was talking or I didn't realize that there were two characters instead of one character because the voices were so similar. So I will definitely read this play at some point to get some of that straight, but the gist I got of it was really good. And that is it. Those are all the things that I read for the Reading Rush this year. Looking back on these books, this was a really good readathon for me this year. I read good things and I'm very pleased by that. Now, I'm entirely sure if I will do the Reading Rush again in the future. I feel like after this year's events and some other stuff that's happened that maybe this readathon is a bit played out for me. I'm moving on. Time to find something else to do during the summer months, but it has been fun. I can say that. So if you have read any of these books and you want to talk about them, or if you want to read them, leave me a comment down below. I always love hearing from you guys. Thank you so much for watching, and I'll be back again very soon. And until then, bye.